Welcome to the Driving Change Podcast on the Evergreen Podcast Network, where we live at the intersection of neuroscience and storytelling. If you love great stories and you love understanding the mindset it takes to be a world-class change agent, then join us as our fascinating guests from all walks of life unpack their unique journeys of perseverance and passion, of expertise and experience, and be inspired to use your own story to drive change. Well, welcome back to the Driving Change Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Bloomfield. Um, you're going to recognize today's guest because this is his second tour of duty here on the Driving Change Podcast. But, but I want to ask the question, and we're going to do something a little different this time. So we know now that millions of people across six continents have reported this personal near-death experience. These accounts have been so consistent in so many ways. They've been so fascinating in so many ways. But because of technology and, and the ability to communicate and the ability to connect, our, our, our today's guest author, John Burke, his first book, Imagine Heaven, was such a powerful articulation of all of these kind of a complete aggregation of a lot of th- thousands of interviews he had with people who experienced this, had this near-death experience and what it was like over on the other side and some of the consistencies he found. Well, guess what? He's got a new book that just dropped called Imagine the God of Heaven. And this is an incredible next step into not just what happened over there, but in the consistency that they found was everyone seemed to experience some level of this incredible love and light in this being that they encountered. And so we're going to dive into his newest book, Imagine the God of Heaven. And if you're not familiar with, with John Burke, maybe this is the first time you've been on the, on the, on the episode, on the podcast, on the show. He's, he's a New York Times bestselling author of, I mentioned before, Imagine Heaven, with No Perfect People Allowed. That's one of the ones books, Soul Revolution, Unshockable Love. And he and his wife, Kathy, actually founded Gateway Church down in Texas, which is a multi-site church based in Austin. He's an international speaker. He's addressed hundreds of thousands of people in over 30 countries on topics of leadership, spiritual growth, the exhilarating life to come. And I will tell you, he's uh, he's not just a pastor. He's a converted agnostic who, through his own pursuit of who this person is we're about to talk to has become a foremost thought leader in the, around the world in what it might be like on the, on the other side. And not just from opinion, but from a scientific rationale through research. And so I can't wait to dive into this a little bit with you on this episode. John, welcome back to the show. Oh, thanks for having me back, Jeff. This is, this is great. And um, I'm super excited for the uh, audience to, to go grab this book and dive into it. What, what made you decide, just out of curiosity, to go to the next level? So you wrote Imagine Heaven. And at what point did you have this thought is, hey, I want to go a little deeper than this, than Imagine Heaven. I want to take it to the next level. Uh, well, in truth, I, I didn't. I, uh, I quit writing after Imagine Heaven. So I wrote Imagine Heaven eight years ago. And, um, you know, usually when you have a New York Times bestselling book that sells a million copies, you write again. And I was like, you know, I think I did what I was supposed to do. And I was, you know, I was leading a, um, a large multi-site church. And I just felt like, um, you know, that's what I need to focus on is, is leading well. And, and so I quit. And, um, and then uh, during COVID, I mean... I felt like God was making it really clear to me that it was time for me to pass the baton of leadership and go through a whole succession um, planning and to write again, and that the topic was was God, and really how and and you know really that was that was the main that was the only thing I was interested in writing on. And here's why, Jeff. You know, as you said, I've. I've interviewed or studied thousands of people who have clinically died. And, and you know, I, I, I try to focus in on those. I mean, in the book, we're talking about engineers, doctors, surgeons, anesthesiologists, CEOs, commercial airline pilots, bank presidents. These are people who they have nothing to gain. And in fact, all credibility to lose by talking about this wild thing that happened to them when they clinically died, when their heart stopped beating. And some of them have documented medical evidence that they were, they were dead on our terms, you know, no brain waves for an hour and 45 minutes, 
you know, one spine surgeon for 30 minutes, stuck underwater for 30 minutes. So figure out how, to, how does someone like that come back, right? Um, and yet they consistently talk about, you know, what I wrote about in Imagine Heaven of this life to come that is truly the experience of life in dimensions beyond our limited three spatial and one time dimension. And that's what they're talking about. But of all the, the, you know, of all the amazing things they would say to me about the, the beauty and the, the colors and the you know, beauty like earth, mountains and trees and forests and flowers, reunions with people who had died before them, um, just incredible experiences as well, like life on steroids. That's, that's what they would, what they would con- consistently say is, that's the real life. This is the shadow. That's the real thing. But what made me want to write about this is that consistently what they would say is, but you know, of all of that, nothing, nothing at all compared to just being in the presence of this God of light and love who knew them so personally. Like no one's ever known you that well and loved you and accepted you that much and saw you as that unique. Um, and, and they just can't, they can't stop talking about the, the characteristics and the heart and the conversations and, and even the fun and the laughter they had with this, with this God of, of light and love. And so I, you know, I felt like that's worth exploring. That's worth exploring. And you know, as you know, in the book, I'm giving cases of near-death experiences of people who have clinically died and come back experiencing this same God of light and love on every continent from every cultural and religious background, not necessarily who they were expecting. In some cases, they were agnostic or even atheist. And yet, the, the God they describe that they experience is consistent. So for those who are listening now that might be thinking, ah, oh, this is going to be one of those kind of churchy podcasts. I don't want to listen to us. Uh, <laughs> I, I want to challenge you for a second. That's where I was. Right? I, well, I want, I, want you to, I want you to hang with us because as you all know, there are, there are frequent listeners here. Is, man, I love the study of neuroscience and behavioral psychology and, and how the brain works and all those things and, and taking a scientific look at things. And one of the things that I, I'm so fascinated by that I know is consistent among the human race is all of us have that question of why are we here and is there something next? And yet when you start to articulate literal examples that are scientifically scientifically proven now of others who have crossed over, who have been clinically dead and all come back telling the similar story, um, yet they're like, you don't want to hear that. Well, if that's you right now, lean into this episode and just stay with us because this isn't just about you know, trying to convert someone over to Christianity. This is about there's a God of the universe who created us, who designed us in the Imago Dei, his image, and, and people are experiencing him and coming back from it. And I get really excited because you've done such amazing work at it, at studying and articulating what those experiences have been that gives us a glimpse of hope which is ultimately what we're all looking for, right? Is what's that glimpse of hope of we're here for a reason and a purpose and it's just one chapter in an infinite book that we might get to take part in. So, Well, and it, and it gives, it makes sense. It, it helps make sense of life. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I was that skeptic. I was an engineer. I question everything. I mean, that's why I come at this. And that's why it took me 35 years to write the first time. <laughs> I had a lot of questions and I, and I kept wrestling with it. And, and, you know, for the skeptic or the, the like, uh, God, you know, um, I, I, wanna, I wanna ask you to just consider something. Like, um, you know, I wrote chapter two in this new book uh, and it's, it's science, skeptics, and NDEs. And, um, and, and here's, here's what I'm trying to show. You know, many times you'll see an article, in fact, CNN just published an article um, you know, that said near-death experiences tied to brain activity after death, study says. 
Now, if you actually read the article to the bottom, that's not what the study said, and they even report that's not what the study said. <laughs> but it's a, great, it's a great line, and I'll hear people say, oh, well, science showed that that blah, blah, blah. Well, in, in chapter two, what I'm doing is I'm showing that there are 10 points of evidence that not just convinced me, but have convinced many skeptical uh, cardiologists and other medical doctors that this is something real to pay attention to. And that any, any alternate explanation needs to explain these 10 points of evidence. And I won't, I won't go through all 10, but let me just go through a couple of them you know, for the skeptic. The, the first is verifiable observations of resuscitation. So when someone clinically dies, they say they leave their body, but they're still themselves, in fact, more themselves than ever. And initially, they are above their body in the room watching their resuscitation. Now, this is what got my attention when I was still a, a skeptical agnostic, is that they could report seeing things that they should not have been able to see because they had no heartbeat and no brain waves, and yet they come back and they can report what the doctor said, what happened, what they did, uh, you know, and, and things like you know, one person reported being up on the ceiling and seeing a red sticker on the ceiling side of a fan, and they went and the nurses and orderlies checked it out and found the sticker. You know, so you, you, you've got... And, there are many of those. In fact, there have been scientific studies done and found that 98% of their observations, of their out-of-body observations, were completely or mostly accurate. Uh, that's, that's uncanny. That's one, verifiable observations. But that grounds it in reality. See, that's the thing. You have to explain, well, then what is happening? Because just a, a brain blip can't observe things from outside the body, common elements. Um, so, you know, people have all over the globe have a high percent of overlap of these consistent common elements. And I give the percentage in Imagine the God of Heaven of the different overlapping elements, like 33% have a life review. Um, they re-experience their whole lives. 50% uh, or so uh, experience that time works a different way. It's like two-dimensional or more time, or there is no time. They say things like that. 48% experience this God of light and love. And, and so here's the thing. is like there are about 40 common overlapping elements with different percentages. If it's just all in the brain, it's just a human brain thing, why wouldn't they all see the same God? Why wouldn't they all have a life review? You know, why, why wouldn't they all travel through a tunnel or... <laughs> But they don't. But then you have to ask, well, if they're unique, then why are they consistent? And if you think about it, you know, in a, in a court of law, if you had 10 eyewitnesses who all said exactly the same thing, that's collusion. You, you would say they, they talked. But if you had 10 eyewitnesses who said overlapping things about what happened, but from unique perspectives, that's the, that's the greatest testimony you can get. And that's what we have with near-death experiences. So that's that example, right, where someone sees a car wreck, but you see it from one street corner and I see it from another and someone else sees it by a car driving by. They all describe it and, and topically they all get it in the same zip code, but are, their point of view is slightly different, but they're talking about the same thing. That's, that's kind of what that is, right? Exactly. And that's what we're getting in these near-death experience testimonies. Um, another one that you have to explain is how come people who are born blind, when they have a near-death experience, they see, and they see and report all the same things that sighted people having near-death experiences see? Like, I'll give you an example. In the book, I talk about Debbie, um, who, who was blind, has a near-death experience, leaves her body, and sees her mother come into the room, you know, and, and bending over her, and is able, when she comes back, to describe her mother for the first time and to describe what her mother was wearing. And she said she was wearing a robe and, and, and they asked, you know, what color was it? And she said, well, I, it looked like a dark color, I don't know. And her mom said, yeah, I was wearing a robe and it was black. 
Then Debbie goes on in her experience and she meets this God of, of light and love who she never wants to leave his presence, but he tells her, your time is not up. You have more to do. You, you must go back. You're going to have children. Now, the doctors had told her she couldn't have children, but she comes back and, in fact, she does have children. But while she's on the other side, she also meets her grandmother, who she had never known. Her grandmother had died when she was a, a, a very, very young, and she had never known her grandmother. She meets her grandmother on the other side and describes her as in her 30s, which she said all the people seemed like they were about in their 30s, which is another commonality, um, which is really exciting for me now that I'm almost 60 because <laughs> it's getting bad. <laughs> right. You know, and then, but she comes back and describes to her mom uh, what her grandmother looked like, the color of her hair, those kinds of things, gets it all right. So then how do blind people see all the same overlapping things, even though when they come back, they're still blind? And then secondly, like Debbie, uh, or, or the fourth point is meeting unknown people who were previously deceased. So just like Debbie met her grandmother she had never met before, um, kids who have near-death experiences many times will meet a sibling on the other side that they didn't know they had because that sibling maybe died in childbirth or it was a miscarriage, and they'll come back and tell their mom or dad, I, I met my brother or sister, and they're like, what are you talking about? And then they say, well, we did have a miscarriage. We just, we'd never told you that because they were so young. And then, and then, you know, a fifth one, and this is five out of 10, 48% of people having near-death experiences experience God. And that's what I'm really blowing out in here is that this is not necessarily the God they would anticipate in their culture, but this is a consistent, identifiable being who is personal and has all these characteristics and attributes and you know love and kindness and mercy and compassion and justice and you know all these things that they they describe and why in the world would some people you know if it's just if near death experience is just in the brain why wouldn't all people see god or no people see god and if it's just in the brain, why wouldn't those that had learned that God is like this see their cultural God? Why would they all see the same God? And so, I, you know, I just would love to have someone explain those 10 points of evidence, explaining away the very simple principle, you know, Occam's razor is a scientific principle. Well, two, two scientific principles I point out. One is that what is consistently observed is real. That's, that's the most basic scientific principle. So when you have millions of people being studied, you know, and I, I report studies across 35 countries, you know, with, with, with um, 20% or one out of 20 of all people in 35 countries saying they had one of these near-death experiences. Well, that's consistent observation of millions of people reporting the same things. That's great science. And then Occam's razor says, you know, in, in, in a diversity of explanations, the simplest one is probably the correct one. Well, the simplest one that indie ears consistently say is the consciousness survives death. You go on. There is a life beyond this. And there is a God of light and love overseeing it all. That's, a, that's a, it's incredible. And so the, the big question, I think, is here for this book and why you went into this, to this angle is well, why does the way that we imagine God actually matter in the end? Because as humans on this side of the, of the, of the golden arches and not McDonald's, yeah. and we're living this life. Why does the way we imagine God on that side, why does it, why does it matter? You know, I, I think there's nothing that shapes us more than how we imagine God and shapes how we live our lives. And, um, and that's true whether you think there is no God or you're God or, you know, uh, you know, gods are found in, you know, everything or, or that there is, there is one God um, and what that God is like, too. And the reason I wrote the book is because I find that all of us, and I, mean, I include myself in this category, um, we put God in a box, and, I, and, and you put God in a box even if you don't think he's real. 
because you have a conception of what that God is that you then throw away. But I find most people have not really opened their minds to explore and, and really let their box be blown open. And what I mean by that is, you know, what these people are consistently saying, I'm showing aligns with what God has historically revealed and, and, I've, and I've found historical evidence that that's true separate from these NDEs, but they, they perfectly correlate. And I'm, I'm showing how they correlate. But what they say is that this, this God in his presence, um, you never want to leave. Like this is, this is the relationship that trumps all other relationships on earth. You know, which... which you might go, what? You know, because you conceive of, you know, like, when, like uh, as I was growing up, I, when I thought of God, I thought totally unrelatable. You know, he's in this stained glass room somewhere. It's kind of dark and glowy and mystical and, you know, sacred and holy, whatever that means. All I knew is it doesn't relate to my real life. And it's hard for us to break out of those boxes, honestly. Nothing could be farther from the truth. God... God has always been with you. And if you don't understand that, you know, he's the, he, God is the force that keeps you alive. And you know, a, a, what a lot of these people say in his presence is he shows them that he was there with them through it all and cares about them and cares about everything they're going through, but he was waiting for them to turn to him. And, you know, what I'm trying to show in Imagine the God of, of, of Heaven as well is that God has been revealing himself in knowable ways throughout history also. So it's fascinating because, you know, I, I, I talk about um, Santosh, who was a manufacturing engineer, grew up in India. Um, Hinduism was all he knew. Yet when he has this near-death experience, he, has, he hears them say, code blue, code blue. He leaves his body. He sees his body there. Then this brilliant light that is, and this is what they consistently say, brighter than the sun or a thousand suns, but not hard to look at. And he, he said, in his presence, I instantly fell in love with this light because I knew he was for me and, and, and protecting me and cared about me. So Santosh... Instantly, he experiences this. And then, you know, he takes him to this place where he is looking out over what, what he describes as this giant compound with high walls. And another commonality on the other side is that your, your, your eyesight becomes like telescopic, like you can see for thousands of miles perfectly clear. And that's a commonality I, I reported in Imagine Heaven, but Santosh said the same thing. And he said, so I could see, and I, I saw these beautiful high walls and inside just gorgeous, gorgeous, and otherworldly building materials, these, these homes and mansions and buildings, just immaculate. And he said, and then I counted, and there were 12 gates. He said, I counted all of them. And, and outside the gate nearest to me, I saw angels, and that's when I realized I'm looking at the kingdom of heaven. Now, think about this, because this is crazy. He is describing what John described in Revelation 20. Exactly. This city of God that John describes thousands of miles by thousands of miles in a square shape, high walls, 200 feet thick, 200 feet high, and, you know, gorgeous inside, 12 Gates, he describes it perfectly. And then he experiences this, this same God of, of light and love. And it's, it's a long story I won't get into, but what God basically says to him is, Santosh, I'm sending you back. And when you go back, you must love your family and especially your daughter. She needs you right now. And it's just a reminder that even if we don't know God, he knows us and he cares about us intimately. And, um, and it, you know, he, he, he asks him, he's basically saying, you know, 
God tells him, because he's thinking about what, what religion am I supposed to join? And, and what God says to him is, no, what I want is relationship. I want to see how honest, how real you'll be with me. Not one day a week, 24-7, 365 days. Walk with me. That's what he told him. And, and surrender daily, you know, to, to me. And, and then he sends him back. And uh, it, it's a wild story, but two years, two years later, Santosh, he is invited to go to a church because his daughter was singing there. She was invited to sing. And he had seen there in heaven this very narrow gate that was open to him right beside God. And the message that is in the church that day is about how Jesus is the narrow gate through which we must enter the kingdom of heaven. And he thought, oh my gosh, this is like the message just to me. And he goes back and he starts to read the Bible and he goes, this is everything I experienced. Now, and, and he, came, he became a follower of Jesus. Now, you, you could say, oh, well, you know, one story. But I'm telling, I'm, I'm showing, I'm, I'm uh, reporting stories by uh, a woman in Tehran who told me her story in Farsi, translated into English, of seeing the same God that Santosh describes, who says to her, I am he who is. Now that just so happens to be exactly what Yahweh said to Moses 3,500 years ago when Moses sees this brilliant light up on a mountain in a bush that's not burning the bush. Again, the same God of light, right? And says the same thing. I am, I am he who is. I'm the self-existent one. In, uh, I report on a, a, a Rwandan guy who was a Muslim imam who has a near-death experience and Jesus rescues him and he comes back proclaiming Jesus, and then has seven attempts on his life because he's, he's now an Anglican priest. Commercial airline, I mean, on and on. People. I wanted to ask you about those, some of those stories because to me, those are the, almost the most fascinating ones because a skeptic can, can, can go, well, you, you know, you're going to go through this and come back and explain things through your own lens and say, well, wait a minute, the, all three of those you just described, they didn't have a background in Christianity. They didn't know the biblical, the Christian biblical um, stories. They didn't know any of that. In fact, Santosh, if I'm not mistaken, was raised completely Hindu and his father was like a Hindu teacher. Yeah. And so he would have had none of that knowledge. Yeah, he was a Sanskrit scholar, yeah. So, so the confirmation bias of coming back and saying, well, I was looking for something that validated my own religious experience and background, it was actually quite the opposite yeah. in those cases, which I find really validating as a, as a scientist, right? That has to be validating. Well, and, and I think, you know, I, I, I think the thing to realize too is that a lot of what these people say also blows the boxes on Christians who had God in a very small box. Say some more about that. It was one of my questions. So tell me, tell me more about that. Well, you know, uh, a, lot of, a lot of Christians will say to me, well, why would God show himself to this Hindu? Or, you know, another, another one was a, a Hindu anesthesiologist, chief anesthesiologist at the Bakersfield Heart Hospital, who interestingly had done anesthesia and brought patients back who claimed to have near-death experiences and he would give them a shot of Halodol of antipsychotic drug because he would be like, That's, they're, crazy. Yeah, they're crazy. crazy. He didn't believe it at all. And then he has his own. And none of the doctors would believe him. And it changed his life. But again, he's talking about first, you know, and there are heavenly experiences, as we talked about, I think, last time. There are hellish NDEs, too. And he was having a hellish NDE and cries out for God's forgiveness. And then he talks about two Christian angels taking him to this immaculate place, describing, you know, paradise like others do, and the presence of this God like a thousand sons, but full of love and, and, and care. And he gives him a life review. And long story short, when he... Asked him, 
He, he has another vision of the same God. And he says, Lord, who are you? Because when he came back, he was like, that was not like any of the Hindu gods. Why? And he's confused and he's thinking about these things. Anyway, when he asks, out of the brilliant light steps a man in a robe with a beard and says to him, I'm Jesus, your savior. Wow. Now he's, okay, again, well, just to ground it, I'm talking about the chief anesthesiologist of the Bakersfield Heart Hospital who was raised in India, Hindu. Okay, and so Christians will be like, well, that's not right because he didn't know Jesus. But you have to remember the Bible. <laughs> you know, in Genesis chapter 12, God, you know, God's story, and this is what I'm trying to show, God's story throughout history is his love for all nations. It's this great love story that starts with relationship, relationship betrayed and broken. Genesis 12, he makes a plan and he creates a nation out of two people, Abraham and Sarah, and he says, I'm gonna bless you and you will be a blessing to all the nations. This is another thing you don't realize is that you know the Bible is actually 66 books it's a, it's a library written over 1,500 years. And yet this consistent story and picture of the same God that these people around the world are describing. And that's what I'm, that's what I'm showing as well. And he's always had a love for, for all people. And, you know, Peter realized that. Paul realized that. Paul was persecuting Christians. In Acts chapter 10, he's on the Damascus Road going to arrest Christians and the same brilliant God of light that Indy ears see appears to him. And he says, who are you, Lord? Just like Dr. Partee did, right? And he says, I am Jesus who you're persecuting. Now, important thing I think that, that Christians get confused on is notice Jesus didn't tell him what to do. He didn't explain the gospel. He didn't explain anything. He later sent Ananias to explain. And he didn't take away Paul's free will. Paul still had a choice. Will he seek God and will he choose to explore who God is and follow Jesus or not? And that's, a, that's true of NDEs too. You know, just because they see God doesn't mean they know him or they're right with him. What this does mean is that God is giving testimony to himself all over the globe, I believe, for our globally connected generation to, to know that he he cares about us all. He's the God of all nations. You know, and I, and I love your idea around, because I think all of us are challenged, especially if you're a, a Christian, you, well, any, anybody really, you know, you, you get in that box you're talking about, and you start to just look for that confirmation bias I mentioned earlier, things that support it. And then you want to be in the in, the in crowd and not in the out crowd. And, and what I'm hearing you say is, and a lot of the end of years experience this, and by the way, this is how it should be, is God wants everyone in the in crowd. Yeah. And though you may not know him, he knows you. And he wants you to experience him in his true authentic form of creator of light and love and all that stuff. And, and so it's, it's easy for some of us to get in our high holy huddles and start to say, well, that's not, that, 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 that can't be right. And then we cherry pick verses out of the Bible to support that. And I think that's honestly those who are maybe skeptics of anyone who's talking about anything around God or, or the Bible or Christianity because they're pointing at people that are Christians <laughs> who have not lived out what God actually commands in the, in the word, right, to, to demonstrate his love. So many, you know, and, and I've had 25 years of, you know, trying to help people like I was who are skeptical engineer types, you know, that, you know, have all these arguments. And what I've found is that most people reject a straw man God. You're not rejecting the real God. You're rejecting people who you think represent a God. But, you're, but it, it, few people take time to really seek. But God promises, if you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. And, and that's, what, that's what these people are, are showing as well. Now, I do think, you know, and, and I'm, I'm trying to show as well that you know, what these people are consistently saying also aligns with what God did through Jesus 2,000 years ago. And what God was claiming to do through Jesus is reveal the unseen, infinite, 
<laughs> eternal God that quite honestly, even in heaven, we won't be able to fully conceive of because this God is beyond boundaries. You know, they're, they're, I mean, so he, he intersects humanity in a form we can relate to, but Jesus wasn't all there was to the infinite God. He just explained God in human form. But he also did that, God is saying, so that God could be just, because we, we're big on justice, right? Like someone takes your company from you, you want blood, right? You want the right thing done, set it right, make things right. Well, we all get that because that's the way God is. He's just, things need to be made right. But he also loves people who have all done wrong. And you know, we, we want God, we, we, we blame God when there's injustice, right? We say, why don't you just stop that? But we don't often think about every little root of evil. So like one of the things these indie ears told me, multiple ones, is that in God's presence, he talked about how their thoughts have certain power or energy. Words have even more power or energy. Actions have even more. And they have a ripple effect throughout humanity. And that's what God sees. You know, we, we see titles and how many people do you lead and how much money do you have. God doesn't see that because that can mean nothing in the end, honestly. Or that can mean something because we used all we'd been given to make an impact life by life by life, and there's this ripple effect that happens, and that's what God shows people in their life review, is he shows them that all their acts of kindness, all the way they use their, their gifts and their resources had a, a ripple effect through humanity that made a difference, and that's what he was looking at. Tell the, the I'm going to challenge you here. I'm going to challenge you yeah. on your supernatural, multidimensional complexity and making it simple. I love that you, <laughs> <laughs> I love that you tackled a little bit of the perception or misperception of, of the triune God through our limited dimensional expression and ability to interpret what that means. Yeah. And we look at time and space and it doesn't make sense. How's Jesus here? And there was God and then all that kind of stuff. Cause I think that's one of the big questions that people ask, like imagine the God of heaven. And then someone says, well, there was three of them. There was the God, there was the Son, and there was the Spirit. And, then, and we look at it and go, well, I don't know, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Right. But you had a little, you articulated pretty well in there in simplicity. So give, give us, break it down for us, John. Give yeah. us the simple version of what that means in the context of everything we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. In the middle of the book, we go into all the mystery of God, you know. Right. And, and this is what I, I like to say, you know, because sometimes I think what, what turns skeptics off is when Christians act like, you know what, we've got the Bible, so we know it all, and you just, need to, you just need to understand everything we know, and then you'll know everything too. As if we can't learn anything from other people, and there are no mysteries beyond us. And that, I hope, will, I hope people will break those boxes open too, because it's just not true. You know? And so we dive into this, this mystery that God has revealed himself from the beginning, and one thing that, that is a conundrum to think about is, like I said, the Bible is 66 books written by 40 authors over 1,500 years, and yet what I'm showing is that from the beginning and throughout, God is revealing that there is only one God, okay? There's only one. There are not three. And yet, he reveals that the one God exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And this is throughout the Old Testament too, and I'm, and, and I'm showing that. Now, um, one argument could be made in 4,000 years or you know, 3,500 years of copying and editing, why didn't we make sense of that? Why didn't we just get that out of there? Because it's very confusing. That's what humans would tend to do. And right. yet it stayed consistent and then Jesus comes along and he says the same things, right? Now, what's fascinating is in Imagine the God of Heaven, I have a 16-year-old um, Jewish girl who was raised by a, an atheist dad who every night said to her, 
There is no God. Your life is worthless. Jesus Christ was the biggest hoax ever perpetrated on mankind. And yet, at 16, when her horse falls back on her and crushes her, she's up 30 feet above her body. She turns, and, and she had always believed in God and prayed to God every night. She grew up in an abusive, very abusive home. So she believed in God and prayed to him and felt his comfort every night as she was going to sleep. So she's 30 feet up in the air looking at her body. She knows she's dead, a brilliant light over her shoulder. She turns and looks, and there floating with her is Jesus. And she recognized, he's Jesus. And she said, I didn't, I didn't wonder what's a good Jewish girl like me doing with Jesus. She said, no, I knew him. I knew him. It was like, oh, hey, I know you. And she realized that this is the God that she'd been praying to her whole life. And then he shows her in her life review herself as a child praying each night, and he is by her bed. She sees it in her life review. Wow. So then he takes her to God the Father, and she experiences God the Father. And here's this Jewish girl who was taught there is no God, Jesus is a hoax, describing God the Father and Jesus and how they're together and yet they're separate. And she keeps saying, I don't know how else to describe it. I don't know how, I don't know how God can be light and God can be love and God can be a man. I, I don't know, but that's what I experienced. Then you have another uh, 12-year-old girl, same thing. And I won't go into her whole story. It's in, it's in the book. Um, and you have others describing the same thing and saying things like, it doesn't make sense on earth, but there, you know, because the question we always have is, how can three be one? That doesn't make any sense. That sounds like a contradiction. But what they say is, there, there's, the question doesn't even exist. It's, it's completely understandable. Now, in the book, what I try to explain is by analogy. So, we live in three dimensions of space, one dimension of time, right? And so if, let's say I, as a creator, create this flat table-like land, right, of two dimensions, and people can only move forward and back and side to side. There is no up or down. And as a creator, if I stuck my three fingers into that flat plane of existence, they would see me as three, three circles, right? Three round circles. Now, if I said to them, I'm not actually three round circles, I'm one being. Well, in, in Flatland, three circles can never be one. Why? Well, because it can never stack up in another dimension into one me, one being. And so other dimensions allow for things that in our dimensionality may feel like a contradiction. Actually, it's a paradox. It's not a, a contradiction. Right. I mean, and if, you, if you've learned anything about quantum mechanics, there's a, there are a lot of contra, you know, things that are paradoxes about science that we're discovering. Which should blow your mind even more about there has to be something else than someone else, right? The more paradoxes you discover as a scientist, the more it should make you go, wait a minute, this isn't this isn't well, fit in my dimensional reality, so it has to be something else. And, and, and you know, science, the, 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 the big challenge of science back in the early 1900s, you know, Einstein was trying to find the unified field theory because, you know, they found that quantum mechanics perfectly works for, you know, all that we've developed in technology, right, on the microscopic level. And general relativity works to describe massive bodies like planets and stars and supernovas and all that, but they don't work together. Kaluza Klein, these two uh, scientists, uh, mathematicians, came up with a mathematical theory that showed that they do work together if you add a fifth dimension, a dimensionality beyond ours. And so even our scientists are going, there must be dimensions beyond ours. So why is it so preposterous to think that there is life beyond our limited three dimensions of space and one dimension of time? When as humans, we're so perplexed and fearful of the unknown, and there's some things that are unknown, like I wonder what tomorrow's going to be like, and then there's the unknown of 
what the heck's on the other side of life? And so the, the bigger the unknown, the greater the fear. And the more we don't, the more unfamiliar we are with something, the more we kind of huddle into our safety boxes, right? Because we don't, we don't really even want to, to know what might be there because it might not be good in, in our own fearful mind. So when, when you think about, because we could go so many places, rabbit holes, and we're kind of coming up on the end here. And I want to make sure people know where to go to get this. But I, I have another big question for you before we do. For those of us who've not had an NDE, for those of us who are walking and stumbling and bumbling through life trying to figure out purpose, one of the things you started to get into toward the third section of the book is what does this really truly mean if, A, you believe there's something more, there was, a, there was an infinite being who created everything, including you, who has a deep, passionate love for you. How does that inform the way we should live our life every day? And what are, what are ways that we can... How do we step into that realm on a regular basis and experience that kind of love and light when we're in this dimension? And, and I'm, you get so yeah. jealous of those who are there, right? Like, how, how do we do that? How do we bottle that and bring it into our lives every day here while we're here on this side and this stuck in this two dimensional? I feel like I'm in flatland sometimes, right? Well, me too. And by the way, I've never had a near death experience and I don't have mystical experiences. I don't. And I've, I've asked God about that. And, and I feel like what he said is, you know what? I've, I've made you to be a bridge to people who are like you. You know, uh, so connecting these things that they, they are, they are weird. You know, I'll, I'll admit it. You know, it's like I talk to dead people. <laughs> yeah, it's weird. <laughs> Actually, they're more alive than, you know, any live people uh, once they see, you know, life on the other side. But you only talk to them once they've come back alive. Exactly. Don't, yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't talk to them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That'll be your next book. Yeah, no, I got to be careful saying that, don't I? Um, <laughs> you know, to, to answer your question, I, I love a guy who came to me um, who had had a near-death experience. He's a CEO. Um, in fact, he was, he was high up medical uh, executive of the fastest growing pharmaceutical company in the world. They were on Time Magazine cover. They were bringing an Alzheimer's drug to market that they thought was going to be a cure, all this stuff. When he has all these embolisms in his leg travel up, stop his heart, sepsis, he dies for 30 minutes. 30 minutes, no brain waves. And he has all the, all the regular things you know, that are report on NDEs. And he finds himself in, in the presence of Jesus, and, um, you know, this, this, this tough, analytical, five-year, 10-year plan CEO can never, every time I interview him, I've interviewed him four or five times, he can never hold it together when he talks about what that was like. Mm. Um, because it was so, he just, he just said, you know, the, the experience of that kind of love and that kind of intimacy, intimacy. You know, there's no relationship on this earth, not your most intimate. And, and I've asked a lot of people this, and they say, no, nothing. No great experience, no ecstatic experience, nothing you can think of is as good. Now just think about that for a second. Just let your mind go wild for a second. Right, right. It sounds, it sounds bizarre, but again... We so fail to realize that every good thing that we love, if there's a God, we only love it because he created us with the ability to enjoy it or love it. So why do we, why do we think he hates it or something? Like he's, you know, he's sitting up there with his arms crossed going, anybody having fun down there? Well, stop it, you know? <laughs> Don't make me start smiting again. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> and that's not, that's not who he is. Well, so... The CEO, um, Randy, is, is walking with Jesus and just having this incredible experience of joy, just joy. I mean, he said it was just like, and he'd had a hard childhood. And, um, and Jesus says, I'm going to send you back. I have more for you to do. You, 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 know, you still have more. You have a purpose. And this is the thing. We all have a purpose. We have a created purpose. And, uh, and so Randy, you know, he's a, he's a CEO. He's a five-year, 10-year plan kind of guy. And so he says, I don't want to go back. <laughs> That's hard. I don't want to go back there. Right. Uh, also consistent. 
And, and he said, well, if I, if I have to go back, then tell me, what is my purpose? Tell me what my purpose is so I'll, uh, so I'll know. And the Lord says to him, no, I won't tell you what your purpose is because you would be tempted to get out ahead of me. And I don't want that. I want you to walk with me. I want you to depend on me. And your purpose will be revealed. And what Randy said, he realizes moment by moment. Wow. It's, really, it's really what Jesus said his last night on earth. You know, he said, abide like, like a, you know, just like a, a branch has to stay connected to the vine for grapes to grow. So you stay connected to me and you'll bear much fruit. But apart from that connection, you can do nothing. And so is the way it's the way to do that, and we'll close the close with this then, because you got you get into toward the end there that the, the conversational language of God is through generally th- we know is it's through prayer. Um and, and that kind of idea, some people talk of it as meditation, prayer, the conversation, like how do you activate that every day? Well, and that's it. You you start to learn, and I and I go into that, of learning how to walk throughout your life with God, moment by moment. And, and, and so prayer becomes a, a conversation you're having in your, in your spirit, in your mind with God, but you're also learning how to hear those prompting thoughts of God. And this is what indie ears talk about. The, the conversation on the other side is thought to thought. It's, it's more of this full impression. On the other side, it's real clear. Here it's not. It's something we have to learn how to do, how to discern. But what I found is the more you practice, you do start to see. It does become easier to see. Um, but it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's the only thing I think we have to do. It's, all, it's the only thing God wants. I don't think God has this long list of make sure you're, you know, not doing this and doing that and not doing this and not doing that. In fact, the Bible says this. It says simply walk with God's spirit and you won't. All those old habits and addictions and things that hurt yourself and other people, they'll start to fade away. And these other things, the fruit of God's spirit, love and joy and peace and patience and self-control, kindness, these like fruit naturally grow you know, on branches that are connected to a tree, that will start to naturally grow in your life. Well, wow, sounds simple. It is. Well, it's simple. It's simple. Just it's not, not easy. easy. <laughs> right. Those are, those sometimes get con, uh, conflated, right? So this is the book, everybody. Um, Imagine the God of heaven. And I know we can get it everywhere books are sold, but do you have a website for this one as well? Or should we go back to imagineheaven.net? I know we went there before. Where should we go to get, learn more about you, uh, your authorship, your speakership, any, anything we can consume about you that kind of gives us more education and teaching on the stuff that you've been passionately writing about for a while now? Where can we go? Yeah. Um, Imagine the God of Heaven dot net uh, dot dot com. Sorry, so it's just the book title. Imagine the God of Heaven dot com. Um, we'll we'll take you to some of that, and yeah, the book the book's available um, all over wherever books are sold. And I will tell the audience one last time. I mean, reading through this, it's it's not. This is an amazingly well done story based with scientific rationale book that really goes into this in much more depth. And by the time you're done with it. It's hard because you read a couple pages and you have to stop and pause for a second <laughs> and process. What does that man? What what is what does that mean? So that's it's that, it's that kind of book. So this isn't a sit down and read it in a night kind of thing. I'll tell you, it's one that you're gonna want to you're gonna want to spend some time unpacking over time because there's so much greatness in here uh, for all of us to think about. So thank you for the work you're doing, John. Thank you for being a friend of the program, and honestly, thank you just for listening uh, to your call and teaching people these things, because I think it's pointing everyone in the right direction to the, that God of light and love that, that's been revealed to so many people through NDEs, and for many people who haven't had NDEs who just happen to know how to tap into that. So thank you. Well, you're welcome. Thanks for having me on again. 